everybody, and welcome back to Joygasm, a video game and movie podcast. I'm Russ. He is Steve. And we hope that each and every one of you has made a New Year's resolution in episode 303 today, January 10th, 2022. We're going to be getting right into our topic of the day, which is our favorite movies of 2022. But before we do that, make sure you click on that subscribe button as well as that notification bell. That way you will not miss a single solitary episode of Joyingasm that drops once a week. Each week. should also say that we're distilling down our favorite movies from top five to top three. Ah, uh, yes. Just the creme of the creme, Russ. Just the creme of the creme. Very good. Good form, Steve. Good form, indeed. Yes, he is correct. So if you listened or watched the previous episode when we were talking about our favorite top five games of 2022 with our good old friend Brad, mm. this one is going to be a little bit different in the sense that there really weren't that many great movies in the year 2022. Um, we were initially going to do our top five favorite movies of 2022, but then me, Hermano, and I, uh, we sat down and we talked about it, and we realized, we're like, you know, some of these selections that we're making in order to just kind of like flesh out like all five selections would be doing a disservice because it wasn't like these, um, or maybe, or, you know, a couple of these films or whatever that we had put in our respective lists, uh, or would actually even be in that list had there been other movies that were of better quality. So we decided to distill it down, as Steve said. And instead of doing five, we'll be doing three. So a little bit shorter than uh, the previous episode, but, uh, you know, that just makes us a little more hopeful for 2023 and uh, seeing what kind of movies get released this year. Hmm. Hmm. So I say I will uh, kick it over to you, Steve, in terms mm, okay. of your number three pick, and then we'll work our way up to our number one favorite movie of the year. My number three pick. You may laugh. You may scoff. You may go, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm going to say, and I think I know what your number three pick is going to be. Oh, really? But oh, I, actually, before you say it, I I have a prediction that, <sighs> see, the previous episode of Joygasm, we're doing our games. We only had one game that w was on both of our lists. However, hmm. I have a feeling all three will be on both lists. And the question I is, that, well... So that's, that's my first prediction. The second prediction is they'll be in the correct order. Hmm. Go ahead, Steve. Where was I? Um, number three. Number three, I'm going to say Bullet Train. <gasps> oh, and why is that? Bullet Train, I thought long and hard about. Um, it was a fun movie. Mm. Uh, it's pretty much what you'd expect it to be. Um, I don't think, you know, Brad Pitt necessarily sold the movie, although I thought he was good in it. But it was really a surprise to have uh, the two actors who played Lemon and Tangerine. They could pretty much star in their own movie. And every time they were on screen, it was an absolute delight. Mm. The movie was not hilarious, but it was funny. And least of all, I would say I smiled throughout the entire thing, which is saying a lot. I oh. mean, um, I had a great time with it. It wasn't the best movie, but um, it was fun. Mm. And that's what I'm looking forward to, I think, when I'm going to the theater or pretty much any time I'm trying to unplug from reality sure. is fun. I understand. Um, the fight scenes were cool. And, um, you know, some of, the, some of the stuff made no sense at all, but it was wacky mm -hmm. and it's kind of, you know, goofy, but I had a good time. And that's like the most important. I was thinking of a couple other movies to put as number three. But I thought about this one the most. Like, this one just kept on coming back, and I think I had just, like, a, a better time with Bullet Train. Sure. Um, I think chances are higher of, of all the other movies I've seen uh, or was considering for number three that um, of watching again that I would watch this one. It would be higher up on the list. Um, plus, Russ, they remixed Staying Alive. They did indeed. Man, come on. 
on now. I actually downloaded that on iTunes. I got yeah. it's like the Japanese version or something. It, it so sounds cool. fantastic, FYI. I, I think they, they took a note out of um uh what's his face's book who made uh, Snatch? Um Oh, Guy Ritchie. I think it took a no, a couple notes out of Guy Ritchie's book, but that's I think more of a tip of the hat, more so than like, you know, just plagiarizing. <laughs> it didn't seem like plagiarizing. It just seemed like, you know, okay, I love what you did. I'm inspired by that. Sure. And I'm going to put it in my movie. Uh, I don't know if that's the case, but it just seemed that way. And I think that uh, viewpoint was common. Mm. And I liked it. I thought it was a very stylistic movie. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'd like to see it again, Russ. Maybe a little higher volume. That was a good thing. Agreed. What was your number three? Uh, greed. Steve, my number three is also Bullet Train. You don't say. Oh, I just did. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, number three for me is Bullet Train as well. For all of the reasons that you just listed, I... Oh, well then. Indeed. I had uh, a very fun time in the theater with this. What was really funny, actually, was my wife hated the movie. What? Um, she she just, she didn't like how violent it was. And like, I don't know, like, I, I think since she became a parent, she's become more sensitive to those things. But it's, it's date night. I know. It's really <laughs> funny, though, like like how we when we left the theater, she was like, I didn't like that movie. I don't, I don't, I'm like, I thought it was pretty fun. Yeah. So anyway, yes. I think that this is a very fun flick indeed. I think that there are certain parallels like what you were alluding to just in terms of um, having those snatch vibes all throughout. You know, th- this was definitely like um, like a character-centric film that all centered around the briefcase. So it's very similar to Snatch where like they have the, the diamond, the size of a fist. And so... That is fantastic because Snatch is one of my all-time favorite movies fantastic ever. Movie. It's it's a yeah, absolutely fantastic, terrific film. And so it does make me wonder like if Guy Ritchie was the director for Bullet Train, what else would he have done just because this is so like you said, like a a, a play from his respective playbook. I also think the cast was really, I don't know, like I, I just thought that they fit perfectly with with um, the, the different characters that they're portraying. You know, Brad Pitt, of course, he's actually, he's in the movie Snatch as well as, as right. Bullet Train. And he, you can tell he's having a fun time. You can see so many other folks in there. There's the, the main actor from Kick-Ass who, who uh, I didn't even recognize him in this movie, because he's wearing like a, a mustache and a little like flavor saver underneath the bottom lip. And he's like totally like stylish. He's dressed up in the, the, the suit and everything else. And he, and he looks a bit older, but I absolutely love the dynamics between him and his brother. If you recall, like, you know, they're, and you don't even find that out. Another aspect of the movie that I really enjoyed was the whole kind of leading the audience down this rabbit hole of discoveries, right? They had plenty of aha moments where you're like, Oh, the brother thing being one of them where you didn't know they were brothers until I'd say three fourths through the, the movie. So that was a lot of fun. I do think that that in a way is one of the film's weaknesses um, in the sense that like once you've seen the movie once, then you are, you know, some of the luster yeah. is sure. lost just because you know what's going to happen. But yeah. at the same time, I feel like Bullet Train is one of those movies that you could, you could even put on in the background if you want to. Like you could watch it several times yes. and just enjoy it, and you could be doing something else. But just you know, it's one of those movies that that you could definitely watch time and time again. The visual look of it was really fun. The style of it, I don't know. Like the the whole thing was was just uh, it was a fun time. I keep just going back to like they were really having Brad Pitt be front and center of the movie. And like he was his star power. I remember reading that like his star power is supposed to sell the show. Mm-hmm. And like the ensemble of the cast really sold it to me. And that's not to say Brad did a poor job. It's just that I didn't expect, I expected him to, to, to bring it. Yes. And he did, but the ensemble of cast, I knew nothing about. And I felt like they just brought it more and they, they, um, 
I, to me, that was they were the highlights of the show more so than Brad Pitt. Yeah, if anything, I wish that they had more characters in yeah. the movie just because the setting itself, I feel, is brilliant where the most of the movie, if not the entire movie, takes place on a train. And so every train car can completely have its own exclusive scenarios or the way it looks like, you know, for instance, like you could be in like a restaurant car, you could be in the, uh, the bedroom chamber car or whatever, you know, you could be in the game room or what. So like every time that, that, that you have these characters going from, from car to car, it presents all these funny situations, which they did tap into to a certain extent. Like you did see them like when, the, when uh, Brad Pitt and the, the, I can't, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. I apologize, but the guy from kick-ass like they're fighting and then they have to briefly stop because then the, the concessions lady comes in with the cart and asks if they need anything. And they're oh, like, just a bottle of water. Yeah. 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 You want anything? <laughs> it's like, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, it was a lot of fun. And, and, uh, that's even with that scene, you can see the humor. Like it did a good job of balancing the action with the humor. And I love those types of buddy flicks where you go and, and the dialogue is sharp. It's witty. There's plenty of action to take place. You have that, that journey of the aha moments and stuff. And so, yeah, so far, Steve, my prediction is coming true. Oh, really? Yeah. Number three for me. What's your number two? Picks, number two, Russ. This may surprise you. Mm. I never told you about it. <laughs> Keep it secrets from me, huh, there, Steve? I'm going to say number two is going to be Elvis. 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 Yes. Yeah. Surprise. I am, I'm actually quite surprised. Surprise. Uh, wasn't going to watch this one, Russ. Mm -hmm. Um, saw the preview. The preview looks, uh, you know, pretty decent. Mm -hmm. And, uh, hats off to, uh, HBO that, uh, could watch it with, uh, just the regular stream. Oh. Soon after it, uh, you know, came out of the theater and came into the home. And, uh, I've been on my wife for like a while. Like, we need to watch this. We need to watch it. We need to watch it. We need to watch it. It's a big movie. Sure. And she's like, nah, I'm not going to watch it. She had to get told by a buddy. To watch it. And then she says, hey, remember that show? We're going to watch it. Okay. Husband's work doesn't count for anything, apparently. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you hadn't seen the movie yet, right? I hadn't seen it yet. So, but her friend had. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, that, that, there's a little merit where we're like, mm. you know, the, the buddy saw the movie so sure. then can make a recommendation. You know, I was going to see it either way, but I mean, I would have been nice to be like, yeah, sure. Let's watch it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't you just be agreeable? <laughs> um, get her drunk first, and then how about we watch it? Uh, so anyway, no, the movie was made very well. Um, like, if you can get past, like, the beginning, because they really kind of focused on, like, oh, the hip gyrations, let's focus on, uh, yeah. you know, sort of thing. After that, the movie's great. I mean, they, the, the actor, Austin Butler, who played Elvis, mm. the dude was just, like, your background actor. Like he trying to make it big, wasn't conceited, not trying to put himself front and center, but just knew the right people. Like was very friendly with the casting director. Sure. And when uh, they came to make the movie, she goes, I have your Elvis. I have him. And I remember like the, I saw something uh, like a, like a, you know, behind the scenes and the director's going, who? Who do you want to play this guy? Who who is that? You know, and the the kid brought it, mm -hmm. and like you lit, you watch the movie, and that's him singing, and that's him dancing, that's him doing everything. Sure, and then you watch like the the what actually happened when Elvis was playing in his on his stage or you know on TV or something. And you're like, oh my goodness, they have choreographed this to the detail. It is really good. Uh, so you actually saw side by side comparisons. Yeah. yeah. Or I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there, there's videos you can watch where the side by side is already there. I mean, I didn't, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going well, that no, far deep in it. But, I, I just assumed that maybe right. you looked on YouTube and someone had already yeah, put that the two correct. together. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, and it's man, it's just really well done. I mean, I think you would like the choreography in it. Um, I never knew all this stuff. 
I mean, I don't really know anything about Elvis. Other than, <laughs> Thank you very much. You know, <laughs> so, like, what do I know? Right. Uh, but anyhow, after we were done watching, I mean, we, we liked it that much that we wanted to see all the behind the scenes. We were telling other people about the movie. Uh, the music of course is great. I mean, it's all Elvis's music. Yeah. Um, and I mean, Tom Hanks is in it. Yep. You really hate Tom Hanks in this one, but apparently everything is accurate. So, uh, no, I think it's definitely worth a watch. And uh, amongst all like the superhero stuff, this was a welcome relief, in my opinion. Does it go through his whole life or does it focus predominantly on just him starting out as a nobody artist and then making it into the, the spotlight? Yeah, kind of like that. They, they don't spend a whole lot of time in his younger life. They do show him um, kind of get one, his inspirations, sure. I guess. Does and it show them like going in the military and all that? It does not show him going. The, they, they talk about it. Okay. Yes, they do talk they, they about mention it. it. They bring it up. Um, I wasn't sure if they if the way that they made the movie was just centered solely on him being a performer or if they were showing all aspects of his life, because apparently Elvis Presley really lived a full life that went beyond just him being a singer. He pretty much just kind of ticked all the boxes in terms of like what the, uh, the ideal Americana lifestyle was about. And I don't even know all the details, but I was curious because I never saw that movie. Yeah how they approach that material. So it's, I mean, it's, it just sounds like it, they focus more on, on the performance side, which is fine. Yeah. I mean, they, they, um, they did say events that led to like him going to the military and mm-hmm. they talked about, you know, his, his family life and they talked about, um, you know, the, the business life behind the scenes that you didn't see. Um, they didn't really get into like his, uh, well, actually no, they, they did touch on like his, excessive spending habits, but they did, you know, go further with it. It wasn't just him. It was his family. Yeah. Uh, they went into like some of his poor business decisions, um, and the poor business decisions of his manager. Um, and I mean, it's, it's, it was a good movie. I, I they, they really touched on a lot. They, they didn't, they didn't stick on just the singing. Um, I mean, you know, towards the end of Elvis's life, we saw, you know, him start tacking on a bunch of weight and he was, you know, we didn't know if he was on drugs or an alcoholism, alcoholism problem or what it was, but man, they really show you what happened in his life and it is tragic. Yeah. It is definitely tragic. Do you know how old he was when he passed away? I looked it up and I forgot. I want to say 56. Yeah. He was not yeah. very old. Yeah. He was probably in his fifties. Well, Steve... You were successful in dashing my prediction. I do. I, I haven't even seen that movie, but I'm glad that you did see it and that you think so highly of it just because now it makes me want to actually see it. Because I remember when that movie came out and I mean, I saw it. And I just, I was kind of wish-washy right. on it. I was like, okay, what story are they going to tell? Are they going to like fuse it with a bunch of stuff that's not true? Or are they going to stay true to the material? How are they going to do this? The Tom Hanks Edition definitely piqued my interest because I'm a, I'm a Tom Hanks fan as as you pretty are much as everybody well. is yeah yeah so <laughs> I mean I just at the end of all things I was like eh, I guess I'll just pass on it but I'm glad that it's available on HBO Max yeah so I'll definitely check it out yeah do so Russ and uh, volume it's good I bet yeah yeah I bet there's, there's bring a, the wife up here a whole lot of good tunes all through that. Hmm. Well, Steve, my number two may or may not surprise you. I don't know. Mm, I think it won't. Uh, my number two. Oh. For 2022. Yeah. Okay. Is the Batman. I knew it. Mm-hmm. The Batman. Matt Reeves has, or had, been working on this film for several years, and it was under wraps. I was actually impressed by how well they they kept a tight lid on the information. And really, it was only when Matt decided to kind of dole out information here and there that then, you know, all the the media sites were like eating it up and stuff like, oh, what's going to happen? Oh, I heard like Colin Farrell's in the movie, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and that's really impressive considering the fact that previous Batman films I mean, they, they, they can keep a tight lid to a certain extent, but at the same time, like, there's a there's a fair amount of info that, that comes out. Anyway, this film was 
really, really great on its own merits. I was very curious to see, as I know you were in terms of how this film would be overall, how it would be portrayed just simply because there have been some really outstanding visions of Batman, like Christopher Nolan's Batman, Tim Burton's Batman that came before it. You and I weren't fans of the Ben Affleck uh, take on Batman. So this was something that we were definitely looking forward to. We wanted to see what, what they were going to do just simply because we knew Matt Reeves was going to take kind of that, that origin story again, which I was a little concerned about initially because Christopher Nolan had really done a terrific job of telling like a Batman begins origin story. But what I think was so unique about this film is how he tells the story. And I think that George Frazier, who's the, the cinematographer for the film, this is the same guy who did the cinematography for Dune uh -huh. as well as like Blade Runner 2049. Uh, he's, he's done a number of films. He's probably one of my all time favorite cinematographers. I, I would, I would probably place him in like the top three uh, in terms of my top three cinematographers. And so having him being able to dirty up the lens and really work with the lighting scenarios. I was looking at how they were doing some behind the scenes stuff and, and the types of lenses they were using the, these uh, airy lenses that really were, were designed, I want to say in the 1970s. And so they have kind of an anamorphic quality to them. where like, if whatever your subject is in the center of the lens is in focus, but then you have like a pretty fast fall off into blurriness and it kind of does a little bit of a, a subtle warping along the edges. And you see that all throughout this film. It's almost in some cases visually claustrophobic, but it's by design in that way. And you're able to really give your visuals a lot more character. And, you know, if you compare, like, say, the Batman to a Marvel movie, what's interesting is that if you, it doesn't really matter if you watch like the Avengers or you watch She Hulk or you watch whatever, it, it, it could be a Marvel uh, Disney Plus show or it could be an actual film they, for the most part, share a very similar palette where everything is very clean. You know, when we saw Spider-Man No Way Home, again, very bright, cheerful colors, really um, just there, there are no imperfections in the film whatsoever. And, and that has really be, kind of become Marvel's brand. It's a visual brand, so to speak. But I also think it is limiting Marvel in the sense that part of how you tell any given character story is also how you give those visuals character. The Batman does this with flying colors. I mean, every you could, you could go to any scene in that movie and just pause it. And it's, it's a work of art. It's absolutely beautiful. The other thing about the film too, is the fact that Gotham city becomes a character mm. unto itself. And that was just a huge bonus to the overall film. I, you know, I would say Tim Burton did a nice job of also giving character to Gotham and in, in his, especially the first movie. Mm. However, this film in particular really, I think marks a new bar in terms of like how they were able to almost get, have the city be this organic living, breathing entity that exists within the Batman itself. So really, really great. Colin Farrell and um, Paul Dano, I believe his name is. Is that correct? Yeah. Dano, Dano, something like that. Dano is his, his last name, oh, yeah. but playing the penguin and the Riddler, uh, two characters, which are not easy to pull off, especially with the Riddler they were just masterful performances. I, I was riveted in my seat seeing both of them. When I saw Colin Farrell as penguin, it wasn't even Colin Farrell. I didn't, there, it wasn't Colin Farrell. It was the penguin right there. Right. It, was, it was just a superb performance by him. And Paul with, with the Riddler, like the Riddler is such a difficult, like how do you make the Riddler threatening? And I think he did a fantastic job. I think that the, um, the inspiration that Matt, the, the director, Matt Reeves, used with the Zodiac killer and bringing that in as well as even this cat and mouse trail with the riddles and stuff to me reminded me of the movie seven by mm -hmm. David Fincher 
You've seen that movie, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you've seen that movie. Anyway, yeah. Seven is one of uh, also one of my favorite uh, movies of all time just because of, you know, a lot of the same reasons I'm giving for the Batman, where you have the cinematography, you have um, the city that has character, you have this cat and mouse thing that's going on. The acting is, is terrific, so on and so forth. So you can tell that Matt Reeves really took that um, sure, Russ. as inspiration itself. And so... Yes, indeed. I am definitely a very happy man to see this film, and uh, I definitely recommend it to everyone who has not seen it. And I look forward to seeing the sequel, which, by the way, once again, is tightly lipped. I have Mm. no idea who the villain is. I mean, they kind of alluded yeah. to the Joker at one yeah. point, but they were not, you know, committing to that. And so it's a little too soon to <sighs> talk about those details. It is indeed, Steve. That, uh, that movie was definitely a fun review. It was. You better check that one out. That was, that was a good, that was a fun review. That was funny. Uh, at least for, <laughs> to me, I mean, I laugh at my own joke, so I guess I'm like goober at that sense, but uh, it was funny in terms of like how I was surprising <laughs> you with the lights and stuff. And you're over there like, Jeez. you're not going to leave the lights like this, are you? Like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that um, was a fun episode. That, so that movie almost was um, my number three pick. Uh, I was, I was deciding like, okay, I'm going to put that one in there, put it in there. Um, and, and yeah, I had a great time with that one. Um, my only thing went with, with that movie was, I remember too often, too much that everyone was using really quiet voices. Yes. Hey, what's he doing over here? I'm like, is this T X? <laughs> oh, I can't hear anything, you know. And then I mean, but there were some just spectacular scenes in there. And man, Colin Farrell, man, just brought it. Yeah. Oh my goodness, he was amazing. And uh, Pattinson was surprising too. I mean, I, Pattinson was uh, in Tenant, wasn't he? I think that's my f- yes. the first movie I've seen him in. I'm, yeah, if I I think. And I was like, that's gonna be the new Batman. Okay, you know, the actually, jury's out for me. <laughs> I got excited at hearing that Pattinson was gonna be the Batman after I saw Tenant, just because I really liked his character in Tenant. Before I saw Tenet, I was very concerned because the only other film I was aware of that he was in was Twilight. Yeah, right. And I'm just like, <laughs> are you kidding me? We're, we're going to have Bruce Wayne, who used to be like a vampire that glitters in the sunlight. Please yeah. tell me, no, that's not true. But I got to hand it to him. Yeah. He's got acting chops. I, he, well, he, I knew he had acting chops after Tenet, but I, what I was thinking more so was like he was kind of lanky. He was tall and lanky. And sure. I thought, man, you got to pile it on there, buddy. You hit the gym quick. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there were scenes in there. Um, I, I don't think I can get the, the image of the that clown thug um, mm-hmm. getting tased. Yeah. <laughs> Like he's a man in the darkness with that, with the paint reflecting off the little light that was yeah. even shown. And the reveal of Batman in that scene as well. That's the first time you see him. Right. And it's such a grand entrance. With the ground of pound. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, no, no, there was definitely stuff to like about that, uh, that movie. Um, I don't know. I just didn't, I didn't have as good a time with it, I guess. It was still a great movie. You should all still watch it. I just didn't have as much fun. That's okay, Steve. That's why it's mine number two. You know what also happened in that movie that I remember? What? There are too many instances where like a car would pull up and it'd be like right in front of you in the on the screen, like the lights would just blind you. (laughs) Tell me when it's over. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the film itself (laughs) is a rather dark film. And and so anytime you have those scenes in particular, it it definitely you're just like, whoa, that's pretty bright. But those are fleeting. Those are short and sure whatever. Was. Sure. It was really cool too. Just one other thing I'll mention oh, is yeah? the, the the use of the color red throughout mm. is a pretty daring choice because mm. when you think of Batman, you kind of think of like black, blue, you know, like red, just that sort of thing. But to have it there, lots of palettes just be that orangey red color yeah. was definitely a. Uh, Reminds me I don't of my know, I would cheeks. Say, dare I say risky, Steve? Risky for Batman. But no, it's my it, complexion, Russ. It worked out beautifully. Steve. Steve, what exactly is? I, I, I feel like I know what it huh. is, but um, huh. 
What is your number one, your numero uno favorite movie of 2022? Russ, well, I think it comes to no surprise. <laughs> to me, Boom. to you, to anyone, <laughs> Top Gun Maverick. Ring the bell, Rose. Boom. <laughs> Um, you know, I went to go buy ums there, Steve. I went to uh, go buy the movie, Russ. Mm. Everybody's sold out of it. I'm not surprised. Uh, I'm sure I could pay top dollar on Amazon. Mm. Uh, but I don't, I don't, I didn't get it yet. Didn't get it yet, Russ. I'm going to wait, but I've been shopping for like the last month to find it. Everybody's out. Do you have a subscription to Paramount Plus? I did, and now I don't. Oh. Because I was going to say, I, there's probably a very strong chance it's on that. Because I it's Paramount, right? Paramount Pictures? Yeah, I believe so, Russ. Um, but I don't want to, you know, the thing is with the streaming is that if I ever, like the internet is so like topsy-turvy, especially over the holidays. Indeed, Steve. Plus, I would just I I want to I want to show Hollywood my, with my dollars, not just like with streaming, but I want to go out and buy the movie. I want to own it in 4K and fork, not just with streaming in HD. I want to own it. Oh yeah, physical copy, sure, correct. And I want to rewind it to see the beginning as many times as I want in all the scenes. Have you gone on Amazon? Yeah, and they don't carry the physical copy of. Oh, uh, I'm Maverick? well. I'm. You can pay like. 50 or 60 bucks for it. And I was like, they're charging that much. Oh, they were. Yeah, they were. I'm like, I that's will weird. end up buying it, but I don't know if I want to spend 50 bucks. Yeah. That's yeah. price gouging. That's weird. So, um, yeah, no top gun. God, Lee talk about like the single movie that paid the most attention to the fans. Yes. There was, I mean, I read a ton of stuff where they were getting funding from here, there, everywhere. And, they really, and, but they were going to have to like take stuff out and put stuff in and, and people were going, oh, I mean, it's not going to be the end of the world, but it kind of like leaves a bad taste in my mouth. And I don't know whoever made like the final decisions, if it was Tom or if it was like the directors, the producers, but I mean, I remember on and like in a San Diego Comic-Con, I think it was, where Tom said, you guys here are going to see it first. And I thought, okay, he's paying tribute to the fans who were all coming to see him. And then they showed the preview, and the fans went nuts, and then we, the rest of us saw it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's going to be first and foremost how he's going to treat all the viewers is, um, this is for you. And I'm paying respect to everybody who's stayed tr a true fan of, the, you know, I should have worn my aviators, Russ. I just thought it. I should have just worn them. I didn't know you still had them. I think I got them in my underwear drawer stored somewhere. I got to look. Ah. God, if there's ever a place to store aviators, it's in your knickers drawer. Yeah. Mm, right next to those tidy whiteies. Yeah. With the stain. They wore tidy whiteies <laughs> and top gun. I could see oh. why that would be fitting. Yeah. No pun intended. Anyhow, uh, they had Val Kilmer in it, which was a complete surprise. I'm glad they kept it secret. Um, the only thing that was that we kind of agreed that wasn't very good and it didn't really draw back from the movie just didn't add anything was the the supporting cast with the other pilots sure they didn't do a bad job it's just they didn't bring anything to the table mm. but that didn't make the movie bad i'm telling you like all the the camera work that they did with the plan I, I i had to think i had to remind myself in the theater countless times it's not cg it's not cg it's not cg yeah I still can't believe it. It's filmed that well. Um, and I'm just thankful they made it. I keep on telling myself how thankful I am. Thank you for making another Top Gun movie. Yeah. Uh, even the, the beginning pays homage to like the first movie. Like we, I'm like, oh, am I in, in the first movie here? And then you see like the F-35. You see all the modern plants. I'm like <laughs> wiping this saliva off my face. It was just a fantastic movie. Yeah. Everything that you would love about Top Gun originally is in this movie. Um, except I think, you know, well, I can't say it 
it brought more emotion. I say I would I would say it brought different emotion. Yeah. Um, it was just a fantastic movie. I loved it. My wife loved it. My mother in law loved it. Who hardly speaks English. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone had a fun time at the theater. Uh, everybody was talking about it outside the theater. This was like the hit of 2022. Mm-hmm. And and my goodness, thank you so much for making the movie. I had an absolute blasty blast. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, if my shirt is any indication, I have the same number one pick as well. Mm. Just call it, uh, oh, hi there, Steve. Hey. <laughs> I was looking call- at you, and now I'm looking at me. <laughs> look at me. Now look at him. Now look at me. Now look at him. Now look at me. Foreshadow. Got the... Uh, Number one. Yes, I was shocked when I heard that they were actually planning on making a Top Gun sequel. I could not believe it because I believe if the first film came out in 1986, it was either it was between 1984 and to 1986, but I want to say it was 1986. That's a long time, Steve. It is, Russ. That's a that's a very long time, and. This film, well, well, there's so many things I want to touch on. Oh, really? Just, what? Don't, just don't touch me. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll grope you instead. <laughs> <laughs> the crazy thing about this sequel I'll start off with is the fact that the world of Top Gun was successfully recreated. And I know that kind of sounds weird from a high-level perspective of, of what I'm trying to describe, but... You know, when you watch like the original 1986, um, did you did you look up the date? Uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. <laughs> uh, normally, I'd uh, I was five years old. Give you a high five, but I'm afraid we knock over the. Nah, equipment. we'll probably just miss. And I'll probably just like, yeah, slap, the forehead, <laughs> slap yeah. each other in the forehead. <laughs> anyway, what it was what's so interesting about the first film was how the way it was shot was quite realistic. It it didn't have like a a super stylized look to anything. It was designed to be present day. I don't know. Like, like it was, you could almost have it be a documentary almost, but there was some fusion of Hollywood action and, and uh, you know, dramatization, dramatization, that sort of thing. But there is something that that is a a very Top Gun look, and again, that's thanks to like the types of lenses they use. That's thanks to the cinematography, that sort of thing. What I think is so special about this film is how they were successful in somehow plunging the audience back into that world. Like it was this weird parallel that I was experiencing. Of like like it's like it's like a duality of being back in 1986, but at the same time it's the, the new present day of, of right now. And I don't know, like I wasn't prepared. Like when I was in when I was in the theater, I was not prepared for the type of reaction I was gonna have when I saw Tom Cruise don the plain white shirt with the leather jacket and the aviators driving on his motorcycle again. It's insane how you see that and how he just resumes where he left off. And I love how the film itself, the film doesn't like resume right where the first film leaves off. In fact, you know, it's, it's actually taking place many years later in the current present day, but my goodness, like it's, it's just so crazy to think about the film itself to your point. has done extremely well it, 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 until Avatar came out. I believe Top Gun Maverick was the highest grossing, at least domestically. I don't know if it was internationally or not, but I do recall it being number one at the box office for over 15 consecutive weeks. Like that's a long time to be number one at the box office. In fact, it was so successful that then they re-released it recently on IMAX. IMAX. Yeah. Which we said we were going to see it. We did. And Man, we did. life just gets so crazy when you get older. I mean, I really do want to see it in IMAX. I really do. Yeah. And we just could not just link up the schedule. It sucks. Yeah. Still want to see it in IMAX. And the themes that this film explores, I think, resonates with a lot of people because 
first of all, you have patriotism where, you know, especially in, in over, I would say over the last like few years, it hasn't really been in a lot of movies. And yet in this film, this is a very pro America film. And it's not like they're, they're like punching you in the face with it, but it's, (laughs) but it's more about kind of the underlying spirit of America that this film really exudes. And I think that that has tapped into the collective psyche of the audience, which is like, you know, there are a ton of people out there who really love seeing a movie that, that is pro American at the same time. There was a lot of poignant moments there, there. There was this theme of reflection, right? Because Tom Cruise's character, you know, Pete Mitchell is aging, you know, he, he is getting older and he decided to not pursue a career that would be hoity toity within the military. You know, Ed Harris, which was a great addition to Top Gun was talking about how, you know, he should be like a three star admiral, admiral at least, you know, that sort of thing. And, you know, you see how, like the, how the character of Pete Mitchell continues down this maverick road, right? Where like, he just does what he wants to do. And maybe he doesn't, doesn't make all the right decisions. He lives very much like by the seat of his pants kind of thing, you know, and very spontaneous, but at, at the same time, he's not impervious to the costs, right? What, what the idea of consequence is. And I think this film does a really great job of, exploring the idea of consequence in a myriad of different ways. I mean, it it has to do with age. It has to do with like, you know, what kind of threats do you have with like AI taking over the the aircraft eventually and phasing out the pilot entirely, just, you know, the different types of friendships and stuff. Those are all really, really cool. In fact, I wrote down some others, you know, it, it deals with guilt, you know, and, and the first film had that as well, but this one continues that with, you know, having goose's son come in and you know you you can see how pete mitchell made it a point to try and help out his son as much as he could try to be a father figure to a certain extent but it but there was that that conflict that was there because he knew the son didn't want to be around pete mitchell because pete was responsible for his dad's death and so that's just one example of the guilt but I don't know. Like, like there, there's so much of, of, of that to talk about. There's also redemption, the idea of mortality where it's like, you know, it doesn't matter if you're say Val Kilmer, which was absolutely fantastic. In fact, Tom Cruise was instrumental in getting Val Kilmer to be cast in this movie. The movie would not have been the same without Val Kilmer in it, hands down. And, you know, I, I think in terms of when, like with his character, and I love how they they actually incorporated the fact that Val has uh, right. throat cancer right. into the character of Iceman and how you saw in the film how Iceman did, in fact, rise through the ranks. You know, he right. was definitely a by the book kind of pilot. He was responsible and, and he was rewarded as such versus Maverick, who just, you know, he never really got above being like a, a flight instructor or like a prototype pilot kind of thing, right? But they still had that super close bond. And then even within the film itself, Iceman, you know, he passes away. And so that's kind of one of the, the many themes of mortality that the film explores. I also wrote down, um, you know, the camaraderie in the film is one that is accessible and tangible. It's not just like a buddy film that Hollywood puts out and it's like, oh, we had a good time. That was a fun movie, whatever. But like having that that sense of of brotherhood, having that sense of camaraderie with your your people, right? Like, you know, countries, no matter how big or small, is an extension of your home. I mean, your country is your tribe of people. It's like, like that's your culture, that's who you are, that sort of thing. And I think that this film does a nice job of, of bringing that into the fold. You know, I have a few other things I wrote down, like destiny. You know, what is Maverick's destiny in life? Like, what, what, is, he, what is he destined to do versus, like, what, he, what is he deciding to do? The legacy that he's going to leave, you know, that was a big thing, too, that, like, I think as every person, as every man and woman gets older they start to have these themes actually kind of organically pop up in their own lives. I mean, I know I can speak for myself where like 
for the first time over the last just couple of years, I've started to think about like, well, what kind of legacy am I going to leave? And I'm like, you know, I'm a nobody. Like I, I'm not like some huge to do or whatever, but like, you know, or like thoughts of my own mortality or, or, you know, all these different things that I think everybody can totally relate to. And they didn't make it cheesy. Like they made it very heartfelt. I actually got like teary eyed when he was talking to Val Kilmer, when like, you know, you had Maverick and Iceman and, and that was probably one of my favorite scenes. I think that was probably one of the most strongest scenes in the entire movie. It had no jets in it whatsoever, but again, it incorporated a lot of these different themes that I'm talking about. And the, the acting performance was so believable. It was so well done. I love the fact that they brought Penny Benjamin back in from the, you know, that was just a, a mention in the first top gun when Maverick and goose were standing before the Admiral and uh, he's talking about doing flyovers and he's like, one Admiral's daughter. And, he, and then goose looks up and goes, Penny Benjamin. And Tom's like, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, you know, Jennifer uh, Connelly took on the role of Penny and she also just fits so well. And I think this is a textbook example of, like how to do a movie right where you're not being lectured to where you just have more of like an old school approach to filmmaking that wows and dazzles the audience and also leaves them with like just a sincere feeling of, of just being on this fantastic roller coaster ride. You know, it's just the coolest thing. And I mean, like the iconic moment of him getting back into an F 14 Tomcat I got chills when he stepped into the cockpit of that. (laughs) Yeah. And not only that, but like when you think about how the film made it a point to show how, yes, even the F-14 Tomcat has aged dramatically over the decades, right? Like when the first film came out, like that was like the jet that that the Navy and the Air Force (laughs) had. And to look at the comparisons between that versus like the, like like the the prototype jet that he was flying at the beginning of the film, or even like with some of the enemies that he was flying against, you know, they had much more technically oh, advanced such a cool jets and stuff. Oh You're just like, gosh. oh my goodness! <laughs> so like even even like as a gearhead, you can appreciate just the the progress and evolution of aircraft and that sort of thing. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's just so much. And this was the one film where both my wife and I left the theater feeling compelled to almost like tell each other in a shouting voice, like, man, that was a good movie. Yeah, man, that was a good film. And the funny thing is, is I've only seen it one time. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, I, I totally am like you, I'm going to be looking for a physical copy of it. And it's good. I actually bought a digital version of it already. Ah. So I can, but I haven't watched it yet. Ah. However, man, the film itself was so masterfully done. And especially considering the fact that 2022 really did not have very many great movies come out. It was just like this, like trickling. That film was just, I don't know. It's a special movie. It really is special. I think the only thing they could have done, which is a very small thing, mm. I th- I think they could have brought like the actors who played like Hollywood, Wolfman, yes. Slider, even if they were just little small bit parts, Merlin. Yeah, you know, I uh, I would have loved to see all the all the actors back. I mean, I'm sure they would have you know continued their careers, you know, in the in the in the military. Um, Maybe, I'm sure they were all like busy doing their own projects and whatnot, but that would be like the only cool thing if they were to add something. Uh, I mean, Tom, uh, uh, well, Don Ham is the last name. Mm. Don, Tom, something like that. I don't know. Mr. I, Ham. I know uh, the the gentleman from Mad Men. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he was fine in it, but he it wasn't as special as like Ed Harris, for example. Ed Harris just plays the oh, military yeah. role. Like, yes, he's in it. Yeah. Like, I don't care how old he is. Put him in the movie, you yeah. know? Uh, but I, that's the one thing I just want them to, if they could have incorporated all the actors that played the other pilots, that would have been like the cherry on top. If you haven't seen Top Gun Maverick, stop watching us and go watch the movie itself. Pure cinematic quality. Like, like this is 
the reason why I watch movies. This is a great example of this. Doesn't come very often. And there are films that get close to it, but like, I really do feel, I mean, like this movie stands. I, I think this movie is actually better than the first one in certain ways. How were you saying that earlier? It's just crazy. Like how, you know, the first one was the trailblazer, right? Like no one had, had seen a movie like that before, but this one, it just, it, it, it goes in directions I didn't anticipate. I figured it was going to be like another one of those like flight jock type uh, movies and like, you know, hey, what's going on? Yeah, put down humor. With that, you know, and instead they went this completely other direction that, man. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Did you have any final words, Steve? I don't, Ross. Mm. Well, best two out of three mm. in terms of our list. <laughs> Threw a curveball in there. Yeah, I'm a practicing sly dog. That's right. That wraps up this episode of Joygasm. We appreciate you hanging out with us. If you enjoyed this episode, we invite you to check out patreon.com slash joygasm where you can enjoy exclusive perks and early access to the show. Not to mention, it financially helps us continue doing the podcast. Also, click on that subscribe button as well as that notification bell. That way you will not miss a single episode of Joygasm that drops once a week each week. And while you're at it, if you are so inclined, you can do a search for us for at Joygasm TV on your favorite social media platform of choice. It's great to be able to add additional Joygasm members to the family. Last but not least, do a search for Joygasm TV on Twitch to see us stream our gaming adventures live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Central Time. Just go to twitch.tv slash Joygasm TV spelled J O Y. G A S M T V. We'll see you next time.